on a related businesses. And thank you very much. Okay, we move on to uh, bylaws for marijuana related businesses. And as I did with urban food, I will ask uh, our staff to outline for council and the public the proposed changes for this evening. The purpose of this bylaw is to amend the zoning regulation bylaw to, def to define storefront marijuana retailer as a use and to restrict the location of this use. Storefront marijuana retailer would be prohibited in all zones except where expressly permitted under the zoning regulation bylaw. The matter for Council's consideration is the supportability of this zoning regulation bylaw amendment. Thank you very much. So with that, uh, questions for staff before we begin the hearing? Councillor Isaac? Yeah, so some members of the public have inquired about what the application process will be um, if this is approved tonight. And obviously the technical language is contained in the bylaw, but uh, specifically one question is, will uh, an applicant have to wait for the rezoning to be completed, so council changing the zoning before they can apply for a business license? So Mr. Coates, can you answer that question and also uh, just a bit more outline what the next steps are? Should this pass tonight, what will happen? both for existing businesses, for neighbors who might want to have input onto existing businesses, and so on. Through my helps. Um, so there's a number, number of processes that, uh, that would begin should the um, should council give uh, con final consideration to the, uh, to the zoning bylaw. Uh, there's a secondary bylaw that accompanies that, which is um, the uh, proposed um, business regulation bylaws specific to marijuana related businesses so um, on the on the first part um, so if the zoning bylaw is um, adopted that would uh, create a situation in the city from a zoning perspective that um, no zones would permit marijuana retails retailers and that uh, Anyone uh, wishing to conduct that business would uh, would have to apply to the city for a rezoning application to enable that to occur. Um, and then the second the second bylaw is the business regulation bylaw that would apply uh, to businesses that would be operating. Um, so to the first question uh, from Councillor Isaac, it was uh, would there be a delay? I think in in the application for a business license, no businesses can apply for the license. It's just that the processes that are required to be completed would have to take place before the license could be issued. Um, so just, just a footnote to the business regulation bylaw that, um, so that is one that council can give consideration to third reading this evening and that um, the adoption of that likewise with the, um, the previous uh, business regulation bylaw for the urban food production would have to come back to council on the September the 22nd for those regulations to be implemented. And then, thank you. The other question, so uh, there's some um, marijuana or cannabis related businesses that don't involve like a retail um, storefront component, either um, the preparation of edible products or other uh, stages in the production process. So. Does this bylaw cover those at all, or is it specifically related to the retail sales? Through my helps, and so in, in Council's package tonight, um, there is additional staff reports, uh, initial staff report relating to the business regulation bylaw that, that discusses that issue in particular. And as the, uh, as the consultation uh, with business businesses uh, was undertaken and staff uh, undertook further review of the bylaw that had been drafted and given second reading by council, it did uh, become apparent that there was uh, a bit of a, a gap in terms of the bylaw as it applied to, to businesses that distribute marijuana but might not be considered to be sort of um, specifically a, a, a storefront retailer. And so uh, in that report, there are amendments to the proposed business regulation bylaw put forward for council to give consideration to that would close that gap. And, and the essence of that would mean that should council consider 
initiating those changes that those businesses that distribute marijuana would be treated uh, from a business licensing perspective at the same level as, as a storefront retailer. And there, there's sort of a, um, three tiers in the business regulations. Two of those tiers would apply uh, to, the, to those kinds of premises, and they wouldn't have the, the full suite of, of regulations that a storefront retailer would. Um, but that's the distinction there. And are those provisions in the bylaw, or is that still are those still sort of um, awaiting action through my help? Since so, that would be uh, subject to council's discretion to add those in the way the bylaw is drafted currently. Uh, there is that gap, and so those provisions are not in the bylaw. And if council wished to consider including them into the bylaw, staff have prepared that information for council's consideration to con to to include if that's council's pleasure. Okay, um, I think that's good um, for now. Thank you. Thanks. Mr. Coates, uh, I have one more question for you. Um, so if this passes tonight, um, what is expected of dispensaries or other retail type um, operations in the interim period between now and either their application for rezoning coming in or their application for zoning uh, being approved, do we expect that they will start to follow the rules that we set tonight in the interim? Uh, that's correct. So th there's pr transitional provisions in the business regulation bylaw that um, that note um, businesses that are in, in operation prior to July 28th when council gave first readings to the bylaw, that there is an anticipation that they would um, have to, to come into conformity with the bylaw as they continue to operate. And the distinction there is that those any businesses that are, have begun operation after July 28th would actually not be subject to the transitional provisions of the bylaw and would be considered to have to cease operations based on the, uh, on the zoning change that that would occur should council adopt that bylaw as well. Okay, so just to be really clear, all rules that we pass tonight, should we pass them, become applicable basically tomorrow morning for any business that had been operating before July the 28th, and any business that wasn't operating before July the 28th is not allowed to operate until they get through the rezoning process. Is that correct? Uh, through your helps, yes, that's correct. With the with the proviso that there's an, an anticipation that there's a transitional period to phase in the compliance. Okay, thank you so much. All right, those are, I think, all of our questions for now. Uh, the public hearing uh, for this matter is now open. Um, same rules as last time, five minutes. It's uh, yellow at uh, one minute, zero at red. As you've seen, I'll keep it fair. Uh, and again, we ask for no clapping or booing so that everyone feels uh, welcome to comment. All right, the microphone is yours. Welcome. Hello, good evening. My name is Kate Dalgleish. I'm a lawyer and a consultant who deals with the medical marijuana industry. Uh, I was invited last week to go to Vancouver and to give testimony as an expert to the Federal Task Force on Marijuana Legalization. I was there on behalf of a group, a trade group called CTAC that does policy work. And before we get into really the nitty gritty of this actual uh, bylaw, what I'd like to touch on is if not a note of caution, at least to, to bring this up about the future of this bylaw. Uh, as this process goes ahead through the zoning and the rezoning applications, and once things are settled, we'll be coming very close to the spring, which is when the federal government will put into, will table in parliament their, um, their legalization uh, uh, bill. And then that will proceed through and probably be in law uh, by the fall. Uh, in this time, that they will also see what the provinces do in terms of how do they control their levels of jurisdiction in terms of a legal marijuana market. I think the city must be aware that this hard-fought bylaw uh, may have to be amended, perhaps drastically, to comply with whatever federal and provincial regulations do come into play. Uh, one of the aspects of my testimony in front of the task force, and I think this is a large issue that has not really been addressed by any level of government, is the interjurisdictional aspect. Uh, there, really, the attitude that I've heard that I've heard from not just Victoria but other municipalities is sort of waiting to hear from Ottawa about what will happen with the medical market and uh, with marijuana in total, and trying to anticipate. Essentially, this means that a lot of municipalities are legislating blindly. Uh, what 
what that came up in terms of the in front of the task force was that there was also a, a feeling there is that they're looking to have interactions with other levels of government. They're looking to involve the provinces and the municipalities, and yet they've not really had that those discussions. They've not really been able to get uh, various groups in the room and actually have a hard discussion about where this where this is going to go. Now, Victoria is a very uh, very unique situation in Canada. The uh, issue with uh, retail and with uh, marijuana varies dramatically across the country, even across the province. This is one of the most uh, permissive and open areas for the marijuana industry, both um, uh, legal and gray market. Uh, but what I would strongly, strongly suggest of City Council is to consider requesting uh, some level of federal and uh, provincial as well uh, interim guidance on this matter as this bylaw goes forward. Uh, it seems that if the jurisdictions don't, if the municipalities don't ask for guidance, then it will, then we'll all have to continue waiting to see what Ottawa does, and this will continue to be a matter of legislating blindly and hoping for the best. Thank you. Thank you. We have asked for guidance a number of times, and it has not been forthcoming, so we'll ask again. Thanks very much. Next speaker, please. Good evening, Madam Speaker and Council. Um, this is a situation that I, I brought up and I've written letters about uh, to do with Section 2G. I haven't heard anything from Council about any of this, and no one's taking it um, very seriously. This is the premise of a storefront medical marijuana retailer can only be used for the sale of medical marijuana and accessories. Now, I'm having um, a difficult time with the and, and accessories due to, um, I would say, legal problems. Uh, first of all, um, drugs are meant to heal. That's why it's called medical marijuana. And uh, the so-called accessories are not use medically. None of them have a DIN number. Uh, secondly, um, under the uh, fallacy of legal medical marijuana, medical marijuana right now is not legal. As far as putting together, um, for them to be able to uh, have the sale of bongs and pipes and all of these other accessories, it's putting a legal business beside what is not even yet termed legal. And um, I think what has been happening, it's leaving a lot of loopholes here for um, um, illegal action. A lot of these uh, places are selling these accessories and you're not getting the proper you know, sales tag. They're undercutting legal places. They're, they're like for wholesale. Why? because obviously there's something going on here. They're not paying taxes. There's a problem, there's going to be a problem with Revenue Canada about this, I believe, as well. I think um, it's a real conflict of interest putting medical marijuana beside accessories. Accessories for the most part, um, like some vapors say vapors are not medical devices and are not intended to cure, treat, or prevent diseases or any other condition. Now, you've got a medical marijuana outfits selling things that are not, not even, even their um, labels are saying they're not for medical marijuana. Um, I don't have much more to say about that, other than uh, there is, it's leaving a pretty big loophole there. And I think a lot of uh, Revenue Canada is not getting what it should be getting at this point. And I think that, you know, um, no DIN number. I mean, it, it's putting, you know, if we're getting into um, trying to, you know, legalize it, um, as far as a medical product. I think we should be staying with what is medical and leave the other side to the stores that sell that. Also, there are stores that simply sell um, 
you know, head shops or whatever, and they're legal, and they're selling these products, they're going out of business. Poof, because they can't, uh, you know, keep the prices, what they have to pay, doing all the taxes, doing their stores, doing, uh, doing legal business. When they've got these so-called marijuana places selling them like totally cheap, like here you go, you know, wholesale. And who's looking after that? Who's looking into it? Who's keeping track of that? And um, I didn't think I'd be speaking today. I was asked to. So I don't have anything written up, but I think I've, I hope I've made my point that I think Section 2G, the accessory uses part, is illegal. Or should be. Thank you very much. All right. Okay. Next speaker, please. Excellent, sir. Now it's your turn. Thanks for sticking yes. around. Yes, I'm Ken Warren. This is chapter two now. Um, so in chapter one, we had the uh, an elderly lady who was very respected. She was actually a public health nurse most of her life. And she had asked about what the boys were doing. And I hesitated, but only briefly, because they had taught me a great deal about cannabis. And so I suggested to the lady, did you know that cannabis has some cures for cancer? And she said, which was a surprise to me, of course I knew. She said, I had cancer. I, I went through all of the things that the hospitals can give you, and it, nothing helped. And my husband gave me marijuana, and we made it uh, into uh, like a tea. And she said, my cancer went away. I was amazed because this woman was a health person. And so having been a reporter with the colonist in the Winnipeg Tribune, I said, I have to, I have to get that story uh, from you. And she said, well, I don't really want it public. And I said, it is, it's an amazing story because it has credibility. Unfortunately, I didn't get the story because she just didn't want her name used. So, however, now I know for sure that there is a cancer cure in cannabis. And that's my story. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next speaker, please. Welcome. Good evening. I'm Robert Raffaello and I live at 832 Fiskard and I'm the building and administrator. Um, we have remedies right across the street from us at 833 Fiskard and the businesses in our area, uh, the Apple, 826 Fiskard, Romeo's, Yellow Cab at 817 Fiskard and Pacifica at 827, 829 Fiskard do not support a rezoning application for remedies. They are nothing but a problem in our neighborhood, i.e. parking is a big issue with all of the businesses. We have one street peddler who panhandles and she stays out there all day and she has her business to do. She does it in our property. We have people that come on our property to hide what they buy. They are rude. They are condescending to our parking lot. When we ask them to leave, we, oh, we're only going to be five, ten minutes. What does it matter? Um, we have 15 livable units, all 15 support, no rezoning. We have three businesses in our building. They don't want the rezoning. We lost um, the ice cream store Kid Sister 
because they heard a rumor that the cannabis shop was going in. It's a family oriented business. So they left us for Fan Can Alley. Now we have this. We had AIDS Vancouver Island years ago. We had lots of problems with that. They closed down, went to Johnson Street, things cleared up. Now the mess is back again. We have drug users that come on the property all the time. People buy their pot, come into our parking lot, smoke it, it wafts up to the suites. It's um, not very good for any of the businesses on our street. They have brought nothing but problems and we just like to see them gone. But I'm only commenting on one pot shop, just the one that affects my neighborhood. We have three children that live in our building. We have Stan Pederak's gym that's next door to uh, the pot shop. I've just been informed by Stan Pederak that the smell on his second floor is being permeated by the pot. So his um, kickboxers are smelling it every day they go there. He doesn't like it. He doesn't like the parking. He doesn't care as much about the selling of the pot. He just doesn't like the ramifications of the smell and the parking issues. And that's basically our whole neighborhood. So thank you for your time. Thank you very much. And I just want to be clear for everyone tonight, and, and particularly for this gentleman, this is, people are welcome to say whatever they want, but I don't want anyone to be misled that this is a rezoning application for any one cannabis dispensary. What this sets in motion is the need for every single cannabis dispensary to apply for a rezoning, which is a very public process, which will be just like this, but dispensary by dispensary for those that apply. So I just want everyone to be clear uh, about what's actually happening tonight. So with that, next speaker, please. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Helps, City Council and staff. My name is Tammy Lindahl. I am a member uh, on staff at First Metropolitan United Church, which is on the corner of Quadra and Balmoral. I come with a concern uh, in support of uh, the zoning and being careful for our children. Um, First Metropolitan leases space also for the ICA, the Intercultural Association, which has a long-standing daycare center. We also use that same playground with our children. Within inches of that playground is a dispensary on the north side, and then on the south side across the street is the Cannabis Mall, of course. My concern there is for the, the smell the ventilation system comes directly out. There is no filtering of that, um, of the marijuana smoke. I um, have two concerns that we limit the distance uh, for any areas where there are children involved or vulnerable adults in any type of space, whether that be a facility or an organization. My second concern is I'm wondering if there is some way that there could be a purification system for, and I know lounges are a different story and issue, but if there could be some way that that air could be filtered more clearly. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next speaker, please. Welcome. Welcome, thank you. Um, my name is Katherine Anderson, and um, I'm coming to care for my aging parents. And if just a moment here, I'll read what I've written. I'm an entrepreneur interested in starting a vapor lounge oriented primarily towards seniors, middle-aged patrons, and the disabled. I'm moving here to support my aging parents. For the last three and a half years in Cochrane, I managed the only cannabis-oriented shop which assisted, with information, seniors and disabled medical users in the area. Thus, I became exceptionally familiar with the needs and concerns of this new and fast-growing patient community. Seniors are the fastest-growing demographic of new medicinal users. The Washington Post this year reports that since 2002, youth use, 12 to 17, has increased only 7.5%. 45 to 54 has increased 50%. 
55 to 64 has increased 455 percent, and 65 and older has increased 333 percent in the states where it was legalized. Medicinally, doctors are tending to recommend it as it has far fewer side effects and cross reactions with other drugs, often with greater efficacy. This has led to a large population of seniors and other lower income people who need a safe place in order to take their medication and learn about its proper usage and the appropriate strains for their conditions. With many rental units being non-smoking in the Greater Victoria area, lower income seniors and disabled people, among others, are often unable to smoke or vaporize at home. Vaporizing is a far safer and more effective method of ingestion than smoking and provides a significant savings in medication costs because of the small volume used. Doctors often recommend this form of ingestion. In the last year as I've been researching this project, easily 90% of the seniors I spoke to indicated a strong need for access to verifiable scientific information as well as a safe place in which to medicate. The advantages of the city are a safe place for citizens, particularly those more vulnerable in society, the ability to restrict where it's used and keep it off the streets, the ability to medicate as per their doctor's instructions. It also provides patients the ability to rent expensive machinery that they may not be permitted to use in their residence or able to afford. With the growing pot tourism sector, vapor lounges will bring a significant boost to the tourism economy of the Victoria region. By hosting more middle-aged and senior appropriate events, retailing for local wholesalers, and bringing in food from nearby restaurants, we will be able to enrich the neighborhood's economy that we're in. With the coming legislation, it behooves us to consider what practical options we can offer these patients. Leaving many seniors and vulnerable citizens in streets and in parks is simply not a reasonable alternative for anyone. Vapor lounges are the most proven way to control how this is handled. A city like Victoria, with a significantly higher seniors population than average, needs a civilized answer to the question of venues. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Next speaker, please. Welcome. Thank you. So I'm going to speak just briefly on uh, the issue of on-site consumption um, and various businesses of various, various types, not any particular type of business such as retail storefront or vapor lounge, but just in general. Now what I'd like to point out here briefly is the fact that what the cannabis community is proposing with on-site consumption, what we're actually asking for is actually a solution to the public consumption problem. Uh, people that are expressing concerns about smells, about children's exposure. But does society see it as reasonable for alcohol users to be pushed out into the public space? Would we want people drinking beer and doing shots in public parks and on sidewalks? No, of course not. So why would we expect the same from cannabis users? In Victoria, I mean, it's, it's a tough market here for housing. And shelter and housing are a basic human need. So of course, people are inclined to behave in a way that doesn't jeopardize their ability to live where they live. Many people aren't able to consume cannabis in their own homes. In a rental market like where we live here in the city of Victoria, landlords aren't going to have much patience or tolerance for complaints in their rental properties. I can attest to that because I used to manage hundreds of rental properties, residential rental properties of all types in Victoria, apartments and townhomes. So I can tell you right now that virtually none of those allowed smoking. So what do cannabis users do? They're out on the streets. They're out in the parks, they're everywhere. I walked through a few clouds of smoke on my way to City Hall today, and that was only across a few city blocks. By trying to shut down any place that wants to offer people a private, safe place to use their cannabis, we're actually contributing to this behavior. People don't want to smoke pot at the park where children are playing, they want a safe place to go. But what if they don't have any other option? Not only are we pushing people out into the streets and parks, we're also denying them access to safer alternatives. I heard someone speak about vaporizers here. The Volcano Vaporizer is the only appliance recognized by Health Canada as a medical device that qualifies as a medical expense for tax purposes. It's easy to see why. It's made in Germany. It's TUV certified by the European Union in the same way any appliance like a coffee machine would have to be tested to make sure it isn't harmful or dangerous to the public or the consumers that purchase and use it. The academic research is all there to support how much safer this is than just smoking. These devices cost a lot of money. Upwards nearly $1,000. That makes them difficult to access for lower people. People are struggling with their housing costs to begin with. Vapor lounges provide access to these devices for a nominal fee. Sometimes a day during specials, depending which venue, could be about the same price as a cup of coffee at Tim Hortons. It gives people a place to go that is out of the public, out of sight of children and minors, provides access to safer ways of ingesting these products that the cannabis user would otherwise go and consume anyway, just in a different place and by different 
and potentially less safe method. These venues provide a safe haven not only for the low income or vulnerable cannabis user, but also to the professionals. People like me who spent years building their professional careers and just simply can't risk being out at the park with a joint or having to just go through the hassle and all, everything that entails, regardless of the outcome, it's just a hassle that a lot of people are just not really wanting to deal with. And we don't want to expose minors to it either. As a teenager, I used to walk down Douglas Street or over to the whale wall. And despite the fact that I was a minor, I would always get an offer from some stranger or another on the corner. Buds? Want to buy buds? With dispensaries now, it just doesn't happen anymore. I only get exposed to the option to purchase marijuana when I choose to walk into a clearly labeled storefront, and they're definitely going to check my ID before they make the sale. Dispensaries have cleaned up the dealers in the streets, so why not let the lounges clean up the users in the streets while at the same time creating jobs and contributing to tax revenue? Nuisance bylaws already exist. We should regulate the outcomes and consequences through the same channels as we do for any other business producing odors or noise, because if the issue is the odor, the technology is there to solve the problem. Large carbon filters can completely eliminate any smells coming out of a lounge if they're implemented. An air filtration regulation for lounges might mitigate and be a compromise um, for the impact these establishments have on the neighbors. And noise complaints are an issue that can always be dealt with through existing channels. It's not a new problem. Um, so I've listened to the neighbors, and, and I've listened, um, and I've heard about the drug-driven uh, drug driven cries out on the streets in some of these neighborhoods. And I respect the opinion uh, of, of the community, and I understand their concern. But as someone who's used uh, cannabis uh, regularly, I'd like to say that the only um, way that I'll, we'll be all out on the streets crying and smoking marijuana would be uh, if you shut down all these establishments and push us all back out onto the streets. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, next speaker, please. Welcome. Thank you, Mayor, Council, staff. My name is Rene Gagneau, and I was the first licensed MMPR holder on Vancouver Island. Uh, we achieved our licensing back in 2014. Um, that's given me a very peculiar insight to this industry from a very intimate level uh, at the federal. I can assure you on subjects of odor, it's already covered in the MMPR as to what uh, is the compliance, and it's zero emissions. Um, this would solve all the problems by making it simply the same that MMPR is required to follow. The technology is available at any grow shop. The problem is in the implementation. Most of these businesses are pioneers. I've been in Denver, I've been in California, I've been in Washington State. There isn't really a vast difference in the technological levels between our dispensaries and those in Washington State. There's virtually no difference in the products being offered. And we're in a situation now where on both sides of the border we're developing an ecosystem in businesses. I want to commend the City Council for actually having one of the most progressive solutions so far for a municipality on the subject of regulating retail. I had the joy of having to rezone my MMPR facility in Saanich under Mr. Frank Leonard. We went through our three, we got unanimous council support, we had to address the community relations issues that you are now going to be asking the dispensaries. This is a fair process, it gives a chance for everybody to discuss, air their concerns, the one concern we heard repeatedly was on the subject of retail sales. And what it came down to, we were prevented from it by regulation. We had no ability. We were mail order. But the communities were generally concerned about foot traffic and exposure to children. Again, the subject comes back to your regulations are sound. They address the issues of advertising. They address the issues of hours of operation. You've adopted what would I would say the second best uh, draft bylaws. The only better one is Berkeley, but that's only from a business perspective. Um, but on the subject of inspection, I went through 12 federal inspections personally. We had a 3,000 square foot facility. They would take up to three days. That's because very little of it was to do with the perimeter security. It had to do with paperwork, processes, compliance, inventory management, labeling. Those federal requirements are still subject, even if you're at a municipal level. Labeling is still subject to federal law. Statements of claim are still subject to federal law. So the businesses that are in town, 
are beginning to now walk and grow as businesses. But I, I can guarantee you, you need to do a better job explaining what the zoning process is in advance of starting it. Most of these folks have never gone through the process, are unfamiliar with the steps of basic requirements on permits, um, and you're going to deal with a sudden demand on staff and resources that could be prevented with a little bit of preemptive planning and information delivery to the prospective applicants ahead of time. Not about the bylaw or the implementation, but the structural necessities of rezoning. And most aren't aware of the time it takes or the fact that you're going to have 50 to 60 businesses in different staggering times trying to fit them into your docket next year. So managing their expectations would be useful at this point also. And uh, just on the rest of the subjects, on regular nuisances, you've got your regulations. When they're talking about exposure to minors, we also run into a difficulty that we also have pubs and neighborhoods which are exposed to minors. It's not the subject manner that we're, not, we're trying to prevent exposure to. It's the negative consequences of misbehavior that we do not want to expose children to. And again, proper regulation of signage, advertising, and implementation of the window security should eliminate most of the needs necessary to give the community its thing. And also bring the community associations into these dispensaries. Most people have never been in them. Um, most people don't know you can walk in and look at them. That is actually one of the flaws with it. But you need to be able to see what's in them and making judgments or things without having seen how the process is. I've spoken with police um, at times who didn't know where the concentrates were coming from being sold in the storefront. We have supply chain issues. We have industry issues that are all now bearing into this. And it's going to be a complicated year, but you've done one of the best jobs possible in Canada. Thank you for not being Toronto. Thank you to the services for continuing to provide support, and thank you for your guidance. Thank you very much. And next speaker, please. Hi. I'm sorry, you'll have to forgive me. I'm very, very sick, but I pulled myself out of bed to be here because I feel like this is really, really important. Um, I also would like to thank you so much for being so progressive on this issue. Um, I'm really proud of the fact that I'm from a city that is really thinking about this um, from a reasonable perspective based on the evidence and what is uh, you know, best for everybody rather than fear and, uh, you know, out, outdated ideas. So I really appreciate that because had I been living in Toronto when they had all of those closures, depending on dispensaries, I really don't know if I'd be here. I really don't uh, with the amount of opiates I had to take, with the condition that I had. It, uh, I definitely wouldn't have been able to make it. So thank you very much. Um, so I would like to address the issue of on-site consumption. I work at the Victoria Cannabis Buyers Club, so the VCBC, and I'm very, very closely affiliated with a, and a good friend of a lot of the cannabis businesses around here. Um, so I personally have seen the effects of on-site consumption and um, some of these other places that have been talked about uh, that do have less medicinal requirements that have, you know, just basically the idea of adult use do have major benefits that I don't think the city has really considered. Um, so one thing that I have really noticed with regulations the way they're going federally is that a lot of reasonable access is based on who has the amount of money to afford it. Um, a lot of doctors are not willing to put themselves in their profession, their licenses on the line for liability reasons, and uh, but they're happy to send you to other organizations where you can pay a fee and apply to be you know, go to a, a licensed producer or to someone where you can get a mail order. Um, and some of these fees are massive. Or like someone else was mentioning, the volcano, that vaporizer, uh, vaporizing concentrates or vaporizing flour has been shown to be some of the best medicinal ways to ingest things for people who need to ingest it through inhalation. Um, access to emails as well, so those are machines that can be programmed to the exact temperature, can maximize the effect of a certain strain. So for example, something like CBD, cannabidiol, which is totally non-psychoactive, so this does not get you high whatsoever, is best vaporized at 329 
degrees Fahrenheit. And you can't light up a joint. You can't cook that at a certain temperature to know that that is being inhaled at that temperature to get the amount, like the effect of something like that. Now to get these kinds of machines, you really are looking at paying at least a thousand dollars or so. And that's, that's, and to be legal, to have these machines, to get the tax benefits, you have to pay to get these licenses. Well, meanwhile, you can go to some of these other businesses or you can go to a place where you're going and you're buying your, uh, you know, your concentrate or your flour. You can go somewhere and pay $5 for an entry and use the equipment and not have to, to, you know, invest this much money or especially for people who want to try it. I can't tell you how often, um, you know, especially with concentrates, fibromyalgia, Crohn's disease, in particular, they have shown to be incredible for the remission, for the levels of pain that people go through with that. And it costs so much money to create, like, uh, you know, everything that you need for these kinds of things. Most people, when they're going, okay, I don't know that I really want to try this. Uh, are they really going to invest this kind of money? And I'm seeing this all the time when I'm at work. And I can go and say to this person, look, like, I know you're not really comfortable with this. I know you've only ever tried a CBD oil, but... You know, research has shown that vaporizing these concentrates, they've done a lot for people. If you want to consider it, at least I can offer them somewhere where they can pay $5. They can buy something for a very cheap amount and try that rather than have to go, well, if I want to even give this a chance, I have to go here. Uh, or, you know, I have to go and pay this much money. And it's it's just people can't afford that. If you've got the money, you can. But most people, when you're dealing with health issues, you've got other bills. It just gets too much. Um, so realistically, there is a major use. Um, also, you know, having on-site consumption allows for people to care give for you. If it's your first time using a medication, it's completely understandable if someone's going through cancer therapy or is trying chemotherapy for the first time or morphine, that they have someone with them that can make them feel comfortable, get them water if they want. Uh, if they're in a building where they can't smoke and they're going to be evicted if they use it and they have to go to a park privately, like that's that's just not safe. It's not fair. It's And this is exactly what on-site consumption is dealing with. It's unfortunate in this situation like Remedy that they don't have an on-site consumption to deal with the smell. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, next speaker, please. Welcome. Good evening, Mayor, Council, and staff. Thank you for uh, taking the time this evening for the hearing and allowing us this uh, venue to speak. My name is Ashley Abraham. I am the owner of the Green Ceiling vapor lounge. So uh, that being said, one of the reasons I am here to speak this evening is um, to address the on-site consumption regulation and the rezoning process. Um, being a lounge, I know that we've kind of fallen outside of the regulations that are being spoken about um, in regards to medical marijuana. But I'm not just here to speak for myself. I'm here to speak for all sites that allow um, consumption as it is a need uh, one of the reasons that I decided to go forward um, with my venture and, and with this lounge idea is my, my history, my two and a half years previous to this, I worked at the Vancouver Island Compassion Society. And in that two and a half years, I saw case after case of medicinal users who were unable to use their medicine at home um, due to rental agreements, due to spouses, due to children in the house. There, there's a variety of reasons why people aren't able to consume. And one case that really, really stood out to me was a lady who has very um, aggressive MS and, and really uh, prominent symptoms, including uh, huge lack of mobility, shakes, uh, tremors. And the one thing that she found was able to help her was cannabis use. The low-income housing that she lived in um, didn't allow for her to consume her cannabis inside. And so she, on a nightly basis, was forced to go into the alleyway next to her building and repeatedly was approached um, by individuals as she was using her medicine. Because, as we know, um, cannabis consumption isn't the most discreet uh, in regards to odors. And so she would have people approaching her and oftentimes felt really um, actually endangered because now we have a woman who's 90 pounds, she has tremor, she can't move, she's in a mobility scooter and, and is being approached by strangers asking for her medication. Um, and 
that was an eye opener for me. So I, I made the decision to open the lounge and I've done that. And we uh, provide a service for the community that I believe is needed. The reason why I'm telling you this is um, I know that there was a really good result in the um, regulation when people came and spoke to you in regards to edibles, in regards to the mail orders, and I'm just hoping that um, in this last hearing you guys have a chance to hear that there's also an extreme need for these on-site um, consumption spaces. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next speaker, please. Welcome. Uh Hi, Chris Luby. Um, just want to thank Council for being very progressive towards uh, the policies that are going forward. Um, uh, yeah, the, my concerns with the consumption on site have been addressed by previous speakers. I fully support what's been said by the last couple. Uh, other concerns I have is the restriction on times of when the retailers can be open. I do believe that 7 o'clock is going to be too early in the evening, or was it 8? But I think Council should consider extending those hours to something more like uh, liquor stores uh, by having such an early closing or by restricting the time that people can get access to their medical marijuana would encourage them to go to a black market. Um, I don't think that would, yeah, so sales in the evening would be a bad thing. I think that you need to watch out for that. Another concern uh, that I think council should look at is being overly restrictive on advertisement. Um, this could push towards changes in sales uh, tactics that I think would be more aggressive and reminiscent of drug pushers. Um, uh, there are my concerns that I think Council should take note. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next speaker, please. Welcome. Good evening, uh, Mayor Helps and Council. Thank you for allowing me to present to you this evening regarding the bylaws for marijuana related businesses. My name is Mike Boyle and this is my partner, Mike McLean. We are the owner operators of a local company which provides automated banking services. Our company name is Mobile ATM Services and we are incorporated by the province of British Columbia and hold a valid intermunicipal uh, business license which was issu issued to us by the city of Victoria. Our business service range from providing automated bank services for large scale festivals such as Rock the Shores and Flandia to also providing full service uh, automated banking services for our clients. We'd just like to point out, uh, provide you with some background on our business, um, provides a full automated, sorry, on our businesses, uh, which provides full uh, service automated banking machine services currently to 17 marijuana dispensaries in Victoria. We provide our clients with automated banking machine for their business, providing the cash and all cash services for the machine, along with all maintenance and insurance for the machine and cash held in the machine. Our business retails ownership of, sorry, our business retains ownership of all equipment and cash at all times to create a layer of separation. With this program, at no point does the client or employee or their employees have internal access to the automated banking machine or the cash loaded into the machine. All funds which are loaded into the automated banking machine are the property of our company and are fully traceable. All funds deposited into our Canadian bank account are also owned by our company. The funds used to fill our automated banking machine are ordered and delivered to us through a chartered bank of Canada. All our automated banking machines are inspected by Interact and our company is required to submit and complete and comply with anti-money laundering forms and policies along with FinTrack compliance. Our automated banking machines are set up to provide secure communication with all major financial institutions and card issuers in Canada. We would like to present to Council that the operation of an automated banking machine inside a marijuana dispensary does not operate in the same fashion as a vending machine. We would like to present that an automated banking machine will only dispense a product which is created and issued by the Federal Government of Canada, which is a Canadian legal, which is Canadian legal tender in the form of a $20 bill. Our automated banking machines are not able to dispense anything other than this product and cannot be altered or licensed to dispense anything other than legal tender in the form of cash. The product which an automated banking machine dispenses does not present a public safety concern or social impact and will not harm a member of the public. We would like to show that other municipalities, uh, in this case Squamish, have successfully passed bylaws which state under 6.8E and 6.8F that a license holder for a business which is a marijuana dispensary must not operate a marijuana dispensary in conjunction with any other use or operate a marijuana dispensary in conjunction with an automated banking machine. 
Squamish does not allow automated banking machine. Sorry, Squamish does allow automated banking machines to operate in dispensaries only if they are operated by a third party operator such as ourselves. Third party operators of automated banking machines such as our business can help provide transparency with regards to where the money is coming to fill the machines and where the money is being deposited to. All of our ownership have a clean criminal records and our business can provide fully traceable source of funds as per requirements of operating automated banking machine in Canada. We also have, uh, I've researched a couple definitions just quickly regarding what a vending machine is. It has uh, been defined as something that you put money into, a machine from which you can buy small things such as cigarettes, drinks, and sweets by putting coins into. Definition of a, um, a bank machine or automated banking machine is a machine from which you can take money out of your bank account using a special card. Using these definitions, Provided we feel uh, that we'd like to highlight the difference between a vending machine where people put money into a machine to purchase a product and an automated bank machine where people have to use a uniquely issued security card from a chartered financial institution in conjunction with a private and secure PIN number in order to withdraw money from their personal bank account. Automated banking machines can in no way be altered to allow anything other than cash to be dispensed from them and pose no personal threat to public or to personal or public safety. Our goal is that the City of Victoria will continue to allow automated banking machines to operate inside marijuana dispensaries similar to the model the City of Squamish has put in place in July of this year. Thank you for your time and allowing to present to you this evening. Thank you very much. Uh, next speaker, please. Welcome. Thank you. Hello, Mayor and Council. My name is Dieter McPherson. I'm from 1246 Gladstone Avenue. Um, I've spoken quite a few times over the last, what is it, year and a half through this entire process, and uh, coming to the end of this hearing, I have very little to say. And I think that alone says a lot, at least for me personally. Um, I would echo everyone's comments about thanking you through this whole process, having participated in Vancouver and now a few other municipalities in the province. Um, this has been a very unique experience. Um, the only thing I would ask at the end of all this is that you take the experience that you've gone through with the rest of us uh, in this whole process and transition to that to the UBCM. So this is an issue that's come up over and over again. We've seen two years with very strong motions uh, two years ago supporting your right and authority as a municipal government to regulate this issue. Uh, and I believe this will be the pivotal year where uh, municipalities in BC and the province will have to decide what role they have to play. Um, we're looking at revenues, taxation, uh, interjurisdictional issues, interprovincial trade. There's a lot going on. Um, so with the wealth of experience that you have and the representatives that are going, this is a great opportunity for you guys to show leadership, which you've shown here at the UBCM in conjunction with cities like Vancouver. So once again, thank you very much. And it's been a wonderful pleasure. Thank you very much. Uh, next speaker, please. Thank you, Mayor, Council. Um, I really didn't want to do this, but I can see no one else will address it. So um, the bylaw 8B that requires two staff on premise at all time. Um, I try my best. I, I, I'm sorry, my name's Jake. I'm uh, co-owner of um, Nature's Aid Medicinal Dispensary in Dragon's Alley. Um, we're a 300 square foot facility. Uh, we close at six due to our bylaws. <clears throat> with our condominium um, and I try my best to keep my cost or my price as low as I can for my customer. I have a lot of low income customers that come through. Um, I keep a price that's lower than licensed producers at the moment um, and uh, that's very helpful for my customer. Uh, doing the math, if I had a second person on staff uh, seven days a week, eight hours a day, probably about $3,000 a month. I'll unfortunately be able, not be able to continue to keep those prices as low as I can, which will in turn affect my customer greatly. So I'm just hoping there may be some sort of time of day or um, square footage or something of that nature that would allow a small operation like myself to still provide uh, a low cost of medicine to my client. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, next speaker, please. Yeah. 
Welcome. Good evening. Uh, first, I just want to say that, uh, yeah, you guys are beautiful. This is, uh, this is definitely progressive motion. Um, I want to, I guess I want to emphasize why we should have dispensaries, uh, not just in Victoria. I think most people are focusing on Victoria. I'm actually thinking more across the country. Uh, and I think it starts with uh, uh, with positive change. So here, I think it's pretty evident how um, this has played a role for the economy of Victoria. And um, I think uh, I think this is the start of how uh, we get this style of business to go uh, ac across the country and. When Trudeau was, uh, uh, when he was starting his campaign, he was making it seem as though he was very, um, uh, he was very enthusiastic about helping small business and things like that. Uh, just to do some really quick numbers, uh, we have roughly 350,000 people in Victoria. Uh, we have, let's say, roughly 35 dispensaries in Victoria. That's one dispensary for every 10,000 people. Um, if we uh, if we carry that across the country, we're talking, let's say, well, you know, that would be 3,500 new businesses, but some towns, it, it would actually be a, a bit more than that. You're looking at potentially maybe 4,000 small businesses. If every business had, uh, many of the shops in town have between, let's say, 8 to 10 employees, so potentially we're talking about 40,000, 30 to 40,000 uh, job opportunities across the country. Um, with legalization as well, uh, the, I mean, the tax revenue alone for that could solve homelessness and poverty in our country, I, th I think, for both the sale from seed to, to harvest and then, uh, and then from stores to, uh, to customers, all of the GST collected. Could uh, could really change this country. So that I think, and I, I think those kind of things start here. Start with decisions uh, like zoning these, uh, rezoning these dispensaries. So I think that's really crucial. And and you guys are the ones that are making it happen. So you should be, uh, you should be very proud of yourselves. <laughs> um, the other thing I was going to mention is the the time frames for the stores. I think they should copy uh, liquor stores. Because um, if you are having, if you're forcing dispensaries to close at 7 p.m., um, then people are either, like the gentleman before said, they're either going to be much more likely to go to uh, either the black market uh, or they'll be more likely to go and buy alcohol. And alcohol is a thousand times worse than cannabis. Cannabis is beautiful. So um, there was one other thing I was going to mention. I've still got a minute 35, so give me a second here. Um, <laughs> yeah, I forget what it was. Um, no, I'm lost. But anyway, yeah, I, th I think those are the uh, those are the two cru two crucial points. So, um, yeah, thank you very much. Great, thank you very much. Uh, next speaker, please. Welcome. Thank you. Um, my name is Alex Robb. I uh, reside at 1184th Street. Um, I'm going to keep my comments brief. I just wanted to mention it because I haven't heard somebody else say it yet tonight. That uh, in adopting these bylaws, I want to make one more recommendation that you alter the language from marijuana to cannabis. And the reason yes. for that is to symbolically move towards treating this subject seriously and scientifically rather than pejoratively using a slang term. Second, and this is just a minor issue, I just want to seek clarification on the bylaws relating to medical marijuana related businesses that do not dispense from a storefront. And just uh, clarify that those businesses do not need to seek rezoning and therefore can operate within 200 meters of one another if they're not retailing as a marijuana storefront dispensary. Uh, those are all my questions tonight. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. We'll ensure that your questions get answered at the end of the hearing. Uh, further speakers?
Welcome. And if people could turn off their cell phones, that would be helpful. Welcome. Hi, uh, my name is Deborah Didick, and I actually wrote Mayor and Council a thank you letter that I've gotten so many compliments on. I'm going to write you more thank you letters. But um, I, uh, I'm a cancer survivor uh, because of uh, cannabis. I couldn't get any help from the medical community, uh, family, anybody. This was back in 1996. And any growers out there, it was Texada Time Warp. Uh, and uh, I lived in Powell River. Everybody grew Time Warp. Now, with, uh, since I've moved to Victoria, I've only been here three years. But I got involved with the Sensible BC campaign in 2013. I had people coming into our office on, on Yates asking me where to buy marijuana. What really got me was one woman that was here on a health conference and she wanted desperately to have some marijuana, some cannabis for, and let's call it cannabis. And, uh, I had nowhere to send her, you know, like I didn't know Victoria. Uh, I learned later about the wall, send everybody to the wall. But now, I, now when people approach me where they can get their cannabis medicine, I can send them to weeds on just across the street from City Hall here. I can now send them to the green ceiling so that they can do their medicine safely. Um, even the apartment that I was living, that I'm living in right now, uh, it's owned by a, a lawyer. And in spite of all the the wins that we've had in regard to being able to do our medicine and grow it legally, he wanted to evict everybody out of all of his apartment buildings, even if they were licensed medicinal users, even me, until the property manager pulled over on the side of the street and explained to him if he evicted everyone, there would be so many lawsuits and also every one of his buildings would be empty. What really incenses me is when people that don't claim to use marijuana sneak up to me and they want to buy it from me. They want to buy my medicine. I'm upset. But like I said, I'm a, I'm a stage three uh, cervical cancer survivor. I couldn't get any help. When I came to this town, I found, a, and I've been into natural healing since the 70s. When I moved to Victoria, I discovered a naturopathic oncologist at the Vital Victoria uh, Naturopathic Clinic on Mackenzie and Shelburne. This is what he gives you when you're working with him. And he was supportive of me using cannabis to deal with my cancer, fibromyalgia. I've got a myriad of, of health issues I deal with. This is what I get from him. The, the government doesn't support this. But then for my other health issues, which depends on which doctor you talk to, could be IBS, could be IBD, could be Crohn's disease. All depends on what I eat. This is the literature I get from the medical community. And what really got me was they all recommend corticosteroids treatment. This is a steroid treatment endorsed uh, by Health Canada, the federal government. And in this literature, they say, hey, the steroid treatment might give you cancer, but don't worry about it. It's only lymphoma. And um, you'll take care of the IBS, the IBD, or the Crohn's. So I really, really appreciate everything you guys have been doing to work with clubs like the VCBC, the Victoria Cannabis Buyers Club and the Vancouver Island Compassion Society. They're wonderful groups. They've gotten me to the point where I'm back to work. And now with places like the Green Ceiling and Weed Social Club, I, can, I actually have friends that are planning trips here 
just so that we can go to these places. You know, so we need these places. Uh, even the first speaker uh, that was on uh, made me thank realize. You. Thank well, you very much. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Next speaker, please. Hi, Welcome. my name is Keith Campbell. Keith, I, uh, you could, sorry, you tilt the mic up so you don't have to <laughs> bend down. There you go. All right, thank you. Um, my name is Keith Campbell, and um, I live at six twenty. Uh, I live at sixteen twenty-five Quadra Street, which is the condo above the green ceiling. And I would like to actually just open with this here. Uh, the fact of the matter is, if we have we have been clear. We believe in legalization and regulation of marijuana because it protects our kids and keeps money out of the pockets of criminal organizations and street gangs. The fact of the matter is decriminalization actually gives a legal stream of income to the criminal organizations. This is not what anyone wants in our country. Justin Trudeau, uh, this year, April 21st. Um, I could go into a lot of detail about the negative effects that I've uh, experienced with the green ceiling and uh, the cannabis mall. Um, I think the cannabis mall is obnoxious and uh, distasteful. Um, it's a cluster of cannabis businesses all within four concrete walls. Uh, they both sell and consume on site, divided by interior walls only um, on a single property. They host events where they give out free cannabis within the lounge. The proof of this can be seen by anyone on their social media. It's no secret. Uh, the cannibal all demands attention, uh, as can be seen from their LED lit billboard that looks like candy on the Pape Highway. This sign may be blunt, a euphoric experience. This is flagrant advertising, and it implies that it is recreational, not medicinal. Um, you know, I'd, I'd, you know I'd, like uh, nine months ago, I would have been all for what's going on here, but since being, like I don't want to make this personal, but I'm being pushed out of my home and my job gives a little tile. Um, I was told by them, by uh, the people, the owners of the Canamall, that uh, this is a party and we're going to take it from here and it's going up to here, so I should find somewhere else to live. Uh, I have a six-year-old daughter upstairs and I wanted to continue on our family business but I don't feel like I'm getting any respect. I feel like I've went to the police in the city, I went to bylaw, it's illegal today. And I don't feel like it's being dealt with as such. Um, whatever happens today, I'm sure I'm gonna be out of my home and out of my job anyways. There's irre irreversible damage done to my family because they come in like a bunch of thugs and offer money to get me out of there. Um, you know, maybe this is good for the community somewhere else. Because I think that they're too green. Sorry about the pun, but they're too green. They're not professionals. These are street dealers at Counterfront now. So, you know, um, I've got nothing else to say, but uh, thanks for hearing me and uh, thank you very much. You are all beautiful, whatever you choose. Um, and uh, let it go. Thanks. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Sorry, ne uh, oh, you got, you're just getting your notes. Very good, okay, thank you. Next speaker, please. Welcome. Hi. Um, my only issue is I love Victoria, and now every time when I walk with my daughter down the street, it smells like marijuana. What are you gonna say to her? She's 12, but that's okay, right? And is it my choice that I don't have to smell it? If the cigarettes and pokers don't have to sit at the door and blow smoke in my face, why did they have the right to do that to me and my daughter? I just want regulation. I'm tired of this gray. It's not right. And you say that you can't smoke it on school grounds, but on the way to school and to, to and from school, you can't. No problem. It's okay. So if you want to do the vape lounge or wherever, but I'm sure that nobody's going to want this in their neighborhood. So it's going to be another challenge trying to find some place where they can use. That's going to be the next problem. 
And I'm just embarrassed because you guys really do a great job at making the city beautiful and showing that it's pride. But now it's just like a big pot shop. Not everywhere you go, doesn't matter what park, what street, anywhere downtown, and I love it. Thank you, John. Thank you very much. Uh, next speaker, please. Hello. Um, I've been using cannabis for 12 years. First, uh, first three years I have, um, I got arrested because of my disability or my dis whatever I have right now, I'm not gonna save just in case we're on TV. So I just wanna say I'm sorry that few of you have children like myself. Even my kid knows why I have cannabis medically. Any police officer trying to talk to me, I'm scared to talk to them. I hope this will work out for everyone. I hope everything will be positive to this cannabis, to everyone, and even my doctor, as well as the night on axis of my me uh, medical cannabis, and I have to go somewhere else. It was really hard for me for the last four years. And now I found a place, a doctor, a side place, a side people, and people don't use money or some people love you there to be there and helping you there and not get your money or anything or drug dealers. I hope I'm not looking like a drug dealer here. Jeez. That's not good parents. Um, again, I apologize to all the mothers and the fathers and the parents uh, I am trying to hide my medical stuff, and it's really, really hard for me. Even there's a kid down the street, he's like, oh, jeez, hide that. Um, even a parent looking at you, like, whoa, what was that about? I didn't do anything. But I only, oh, jeez, there's a kid. I'm sorry, I did not know there's a child up ahead there. Um, I try not to walk towards schools, of course, that's common sense, but you know, that's, most of us has medical reasons, right? And I do not like Dr. Pills. I apologize, doctors, but I do not like Dr. Pills. I like cannabis, it helps me very, very well. And I close this as my testimony to you all. My name is Benjamin Sear. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, next speaker, please. Hi. Welcome. Welcome. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Kelly Coulter. I want to shift gears here for a moment. Uh, uh, and uh, I'm sorry that I missed the first part of the council meeting. I was in Nanaimo at a Women Grow meeting which is women who work in the cannabis industry. And, and I've spoken to city council about the uh, women who are currently working in the industry, legally and illegally. Um, what I want to talk about tonight, and the reason, part of the reason, I'm sorry that I missed the first part, is I understand it was about your urban farming here in Victoria. I'm a citizen of Victoria. Um, in the future, uh, the environmental impacts of cannabis cultivation will be an issue. I testified about this in front of the federal task force last week in Vancouver. Uh, they were very interested. I've been asked to do follow-up with regards to environmental impacts. And uh, I would like to just plant some seeds with you all tonight. 
moving forward that uh, this be taken into consideration uh, in the future with regards to urban farming and how the federal government will implement their rules and regulations and how Victoria will respond to that. And I would look forward to future conversations. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Are there further speakers on this topic? Welcome. I'll be quick. Thank you. Uh, thanks for your time. I just wanted to say, um, originally being from Alberta and struggling with my own health concerns, um, being able to have the opportunity to come into Canada still without leaving uh, to go down to the States to seek alternative medicine has been, um, I think, part of the healing process for me so that I'm not removed from my element, from my family, from my support structure, from my loved ones, going somewhere that's completely... Uh, new and different during a healing process can add, at least in my opinion, you know, another hurdle to, uh, to getting back to your optimum health. Um, being able to come into Victoria and have the uh, opportunity of not only the dispensaries, but the, the lounges, the, uh, the venues that are creating a, a healing space that um, I haven't had the opportunity to be able to have even in, in, in Calgary, in my city, um, Alberta. I just got back from a trip from the States and I found myself boasting about how Victoria was so progressive and I was just so proud of it. And then to hear, you know, these concerns from some of these other people, I understand there's always going to be, you know, the light and the dark of everybody's opinion. Um, and I, I, I hear this and I, I see people need to express themselves like myself right now. I just can't thank you enough for for being so open and so progressive that um, that this is even on the table. I just, I'm so proud of Victoria for you guys even uh, giving us the time to speak because Calgary's a big, big place too and they're not doing it. There's a lot of other cities like this guy's <clears throat> talking about going nationwide. I think um, you guys are ahead of the game and you should all be extremely proud of yourselves no matter what uh, some of the negative feedback is. There's always going to have there's, excuse me, there's always going to have, uh, <laughs> there's always going to be somebody's opinion that's going to be against it, and that's what brings us all together in these kind of events. So um, I just want to say thank you again for, for being uh, such a great city, and I uh, just look forward to creating my own business here, and my family's moving over here to start a business directly um, related to the cannabis uh, cultivation and hopefully it can lead together with some of this uh, inner city urban planning for density and uh, maybe there can be some sort of uh, bridge gap and Victoria can be the first people to actually be producing medical cannabis in their cities, in the homes, and you know, continue to be forerunners in this uh, issue. So thank you again for all your time. Thank you very much. Next speaker, please. Welcome. Hi, I'm really grateful to be here and thank you very much. My name is Hope Yayaki Kud. I'm a medical cannabis user. I am so grateful to have places like the Cannamal, the Green Ceiling, BCBC, to be able to use cannabis and not have to worry about my housing, to be able to have my medication in a way that's safe and out of the public's eye in a sense that people aren't going to be disturbed by the smell of it and bars are on every corner. Bars are concern for the alcohol content to children. Bars are not prohibited or stopped for these concerns. And I think that places to use medical marijuana are also needed, as well as recreation, apparently, because we don't want it on the streets. We want it in filtered and well-lit and accessible places for people to be able to not use it in front of children. I thank you for this time. Thank you very much. Are there any further speakers? Uh, good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, I know it's been a long meeting and I'll keep my uh, remarks brief. Um, it's, I've spoken to Council on a number of occasions. Uh, Previously about the about the the benefits of on-site consumption, and uh, I think 
people tonight have made the points far far better than I. Um, I just did want to use. I did want to bring up one word that I actually don't think I'd heard used. Um, uh, it's um, um, what the dispensaries and the on-site consumption provides, and that's dignity. Um, I, for for myself, I I know the the like we we have expressed concerns about about when people are forced to. Uh, go outside to consume that there are issues of safety and these are certainly real issues uh, but the to be able to to conduct yourself with dignity to to deal with your 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 illnesses or um, the reasons that you're using cannabis for um, and and to to not have to be hiding it and to, to not have to to feel ashamed about it is uh, is I think uh, is is um, evidently, uh, or quite obviously, beneficial. And uh, um, again, I think the I think people here have made the points quite well about why about the benefits of it. And I hope the council does, uh, staff and council do consider the, the um, allowing them, you know, making amendments for them in the bylaw. And uh, uh, but that being said, uh, again, thank you for for doing this and taking such a proactive stance towards this. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next speaker, please. haven't really prepared anything. Um, my name is Andre Harris. I'm from a company with in-house software that can help in compliance efforts. Um, it's an inventory management software as well as a point of sale software that tracks everything and can help with um, forming regulations for business reporting purposes for marijuana dispensaries. Um, I, I asked the council for a liaison for us to work with to help develop business reporting regulations for these marijuana dispensers. And I'll be around after the hearing to talk to whoever would like to work with me. Thank you. Thank you very much. Just for everyone's record, uh, after the hearing, we still have much work to do tonight. So if no counselor leaps out of their chair, it's because we're here probably for the long haul discussing other policy issues, but thank you. Uh, further speakers for a second time? Hello, everybody. Uh, Scott, I'm a cannabis user and a uh, big part of this community. And I'd like to uh, thank, say thanks, Keith, for your concerns. I, um, we are above him, and you know, um, the main thing we uh, we like to do in our community is is make sure everybody is comfortable and address everybody's problem as well as you guys. And uh, our biggest uh, concerns are your concerns. So anytime you address them, it's something that we like to, uh, to make sure that we're on board with as well. So if uh, we can make this go along as easy as possible with you guys as well, and uh, we want to make everything uh, work with everybody. So hopefully, uh, yeah, you can see everybody's gripes and concerns and uh, make the right decision. Thank you. Sorry, just to clarify, you, you mentioned your uh, dispensary. You run a dispensary, or you uh, uh, actually, I'm just part of a, the cannabis mall. Cannabis mall. Okay, thank yeah. you so much for that clarification. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Are there any further speakers for a second time, and for a third and final time? Okay, seeing no further speakers, um, I'm going to ask council if there are any questions. Uh, there are some that have arisen during the hearing. I have some that have arisen, but I'll go to council first. Any questions for staff? Councillor Loveday, uh, Councillor Alto, and then myself. Yeah, question uh, just about the consumption on site and just if I can get some clarification around uh, what impacts. So if we, if these path, bylaws pass as as presented, uh, what would be the impact on the ability for uh, to have consumption on, uh, at a at a premises? Of, I, I understand that there's yeah. We start with there, and then I'll follow up. Through my helps, the bus the proposed business regulation bylaw for marijuana related businesses is the mechanism that uh, essentially bans consumption as drafted at those sorts of business operations. So, and, and it, uh, 
it is an outright ban for consumption on premises. And that would come into effect on the 22nd, not tonight, just for clarity. That's correct. correct. Okay. Councilor Lovedy, go ahead. So that would be banned at sites where uh, there is a marijuana retail business. Is that, is that correct? And then there, there could perhaps be a, a safe consumption lounge of some sort that wasn't a business. Was that not, is that not addressed within our bylaws? Through helps to the first question, um, so the the bylaws proposed uh, would would ban the consumption on on any marijuana related business um, covered covered in the business regulation bylaw, and uh, council does have before them in in the staff report on on this evening's agenda a, a, a recommended further amendment to the the city's general business licensing and regulation bylaw uh, that would uh, propose a further ban on any business premise in the city. So that's all of this, of course, subject to council's uh, consideration. So the, the business regulation bylaw for marijuana related businesses as drafted uh, prohibits um, the proposal for, for a further ban on any business premise, but business premise is what is covered in the, in the bylaw. So a uh, question, what if, what if the, uh, if a lounge of, of some sort was, was not a business, but was a private club that didn't sell any marijuana or yeah, or give it away that, that people brought their own, would that be covered by any of our bylaws? Through my helps. Um, so again, the, the premise of the bylaws is, is to cover business operations. So non-business operations can't be covered in such a bylaw. Um, and I just think um, per, perhaps if, if the councillor could re just redo the question. Yes. Yeah, so, uh, so, sorry, Mr. Johnson might have an answer. And then I think councillor Alto has a, well, anyways, we're not at comments yet, but if you could leave that question with us for a few minutes, we're going to bring the city solicitor over. Okay, very good. So we'll get an answer to that question. Okay, thank you. Thank you. You're clear on the question? Staff is clear on the question? Okay, excellent. Uh, Councillor Alto, question. Uh, I had a similar question, but maybe I'll ask the more specific uh, example, and that is... Uh, how would these prohibitions specific to uh, eliminating on-site use affect those existing agencies we now know as compassion clubs? Through my help, so again, the, the model of operation, I think, is, is the key. So any, any, um, any business, um, the consumption on-site would be prohibited under the, the way the bylaw is proposed now. So, so my understanding is that would apply to compassion clubs as well. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, my question is uh, one that was raised by somebody who spoke wanting clarification on the proposed new direction that we might add tonight for clarity and to close gaps. And that is do um, uh, marijuana uh, businesses that aren't retailers that are preparing food or some other uh, item that relates to marijuana but doesn't sell it, do they need to go through a rezoning process and are they subject to the 200 meter regulation? That was a question asked by the member of the public. Uh, Mr. Tinney? The uh Changes to the zoning bylaw refer only to storefront retail sales. So those businesses where customers are coming and going. Uh, if a business, say, is a um, um, mail order kind of business where there are no business, uh, no customers coming uh, or going from the premises, but marijuana is stored on site, then a rezoning uh, would not be required in our estimation. However, they would fall under the business license bylaw um, for their operations. Okay, thank you. So a rezoning would not be required. Presumably then the 200 meter buffer zone would not be required, but they would still need a business license. Okay, hopefully that clarifies for the member of the public. 
Um, I think that's all for now for questions. Uh, do we have an answer from our city solicitor? Oh, Turn he's up. here. Welcome, Mr. City Solicitor. No problem. So let's uh, p pose the question again as clearly as possible because it was maybe a little bit fuzzy and then we'll try and get a clear answer. Thank you, Mr. Zaworski, for joining us so late into the evening. Uh, Councillor Loveday. Yeah, thank you for thank you for joining us. We, we heard from a, a number of uh, concerned residents about, about the ability to have a place to consume marijuana in a safe and dignified atmosphere. And so my understanding is that the bylaws as, as uh, presented outlaw uh, marijuana consumption in any marijuana, in any facility that also has a marijuana related business. So I understand that. Um, what I'm wondering is, do any, does anything within these bylaws uh, prohibit some sort of safe consumption uh, venue to be opened uh, that is an, perhaps a nonprofit or not a business? So it's not a marijuana related business, uh, but it's a place where people can go and, and consume uh, cannabis safely. Sorry, can I can I just add to that question? Just and if, for example, uh, Island Health were to open a safe consumption site for specifically cannabis, how would that relate to Councillor Loveday's question? Mayor Helps, I think the answer to the second part of the question is is the easier one. Uh, so I'll start with that. The answer is it would not, these bylaws as currently proposed would not affect the ability of an institution such as uh, uh, Vancouver Island Health Authority or another health uh, institution uh, establishing a safe consumption site for marijuana. Um, so that's, uh, that's fairly uh, clear. In terms of the other question, um, the intent behind the proposed bylaws is that it would prohibit consumption on any business premises. The tricky area is uh, whether or not a particular operation would fall within the definition of the business, uh, a marijuana related business. And that's a question that would very much depend on how it is structured. So uh, there are, it's certainly conceivable to create a entity that is not a business which, in, which uh, facilitates or allows people to consume marijuana on the premises that would not be regulated by the, uh, by the proposed uh, reg uh, bylaw. Having said that, my understanding, without having looked at all the details and, and not being familiar with every single uh, operation out there, my understanding is that it would cover uh, uh, all or virtually all of the currently existing operations in the city. Thank you very much, Mr. Zorsi. That is, I think, very clarifying. Okay, are there any other questions, Council? Okay, seeing no questions, um, we are going to, I am going to close the hearing and we're going to move on to consideration of these bylaws uh, one at a time. Uh, and I'm going to ask Mr. Coates to walk us through them and there is the proposed um, kind of loop closing change that is outlined in the staff report that we can entertain this evening as well to just clarify um, what happens if you're not retailing but you are making or doing something with um, just so that those people don't caught, get caught unnecessarily in a rezoning loop. Mr. Coates, over to you. So the first uh, the first bylaw for council to consider is the uh, uh, third reading to the zoning regulation amendment bylaw number sixteen zero five eight, and that is the bylaw that that simply um, establishes uh, the ban on uh, marijuana re storefront marijuana retailers in the city. Thank you. Is there a mover? Okay, uh, we've discussed this for about a year and a half. Thank you, Councillor Isaac. I will second. Okay, you can move or go ahead. Um, I'd like to consider the next bylaw first, and there's a reason 
for that. It has to do with definitions, which aren't actually in this bylaw. So I'm wondering if we could postpone consideration of this bylaw until after bylaw 16061 has been considered. Sure, make a motion to postpone. So I'll postpone this bylaw. Okay, is there a seconder? Thank you, second. All in favor of postponing? Any opposed? Okay, thanks. Members of the public, it's just postponed for a minute so we can do things in an orderly fashion. Okay, so Councillor Isaac. I'll uh, move uh, bylaw 16061, marijuana related business regulation bylaw. Okay, moved and seconded. And your proposed amendment, Councillor Isaac? Um, at the time we moved this forward, there were federal, there was a federal regulation in place, which has since been repealed and replaced with a new regulation. So I've just sent council and staff uh, the proposed wording of an amendment, but also the background materials showing the new regulation and also the repealed regulations. So right now the bylaw um, under section, sorry, it's on page two of the bylaw uh, under the uh, section on application of this bylaw, section three. It reads, the provisions of this bylaw do not apply to the production and distribution of marijuana licensed by Health Canada under the marijuana for medical purposes regulation or the marijuana medical access regulations or, or of the Controlled Drugs and Substances Act. Those two regulations aren't actually enforced anymore and they've been replaced with the um, access to cannabis for medical purposes regulations. So my amendment is that uh, the bylaw be amended replacing the word marijuana in the first line with the word cannabis and the words marijuana for medical purposes regulations or the marijuana medical access regulations with the words access to cannabis for medical purposes regulations. Thank you. Moved and seconded. Do we need to discuss that? Okay. The amendments are shown underlined okay. um, in the... Thank you. And basically we're, you're proposing that we meet federal definitions. Yes. Okay. Thank you. All of those in favor of that proposed amendment to the bylaw? Any opposed? Okay. Thank you. So we will hereby refer to it as cannabis. Thank you, Councillor Isaac. So now there's a second amendment arising from that one. Did you email that to us as well? I'm just about to. Okay. Uh, and it does relate to this, uh, this bylaw. Okay, actually, in the interest of transparency, the screens are black, so email it to us, and then we'll just stop talking so the public can also see what we're doing. Sure. I didn't mean that rudely no, to no, say no, stop understand. talking, but... <laughs> okay, so I just sent that over. It's in the same vein. Uh, it's essentially a, an omnibus amendment to ensure consistency with the federal definitions. Um, in this bylaw as well as the other bylaws. And I, I, I guess while we're waiting for that to come up, I would draw Council's attention to the definition section of the bylaw. So this is at page one. So section two, definitions. In this bylaw, it says marijuana means cannabis as defined in the Controlled Drugs and Substances Act and includes any products containing cannabis. So our definitions already call the product cannabis. So essentially, um, the amendment is to call for consistency throughout the bylaw, and it proposes to replace the word marijuana in the definitions with cannabis. The definition can mean the same because it already references the federal uh, act. So it would read marijuana, me or sorry, cannabis means cannabis as defined in the act, and it would also change marijuana-related business to cannabis-related business, uh, and it would also change, replace the word marijuana with cannabis in all other places in this bylaw, including the title of the bylaw, uh, as well as in the other bylaws. Thank you. So that's been moved and seconded. Discussion? All those in favor? Any opposed? Thank you. Thank you. Okay. And so I, I do support this uh, motion. I think it's a step uh, in the right direction. Uh, the City of Victoria and Vancouver are, are leading in terms of providing a regulatory, regulatory framework uh, for this medicinal and recreational substance. Uh, we may find that we'll have to revise our bylaws uh, once the federal government catches up to us. Uh, but at this point, the public in this community do not support enforcement against this activity. Well, they support enforcement against, I think, criminal elements. But, um, but by law-abiding citizens who simply want to consume a substance uh, for medical need or for recreational purposes, they don't want rigorous, a rigorous crackdown 
and they don't believe that's an appropriate use of our policing resources. And so this bylaw, these bylaws respond to the reality uh, that marijuana use or cannabis use is widespread. Uh, these establishments exist. Our, our council has in indicated we don't want to take a heavy-handed approach. So instead, we'll take a regulatory approach to ensure these businesses pay their licensing fees, to ensure there's a community discussion about whether the locations are appropriate in terms of the public hearing process, uh, and to ensure uh, these businesses operate according to a rules-based framework rather than sort of a, a, a free-for-all. Um, and so I think we may find we'll need to tinker them. I think there's our, there are outstanding questions relating to uh, consuming the product on site. I think there's particularly compelling arguments uh, in the nonprofit societies for allowing people to consume the substance. Um, I think that argument's a bit weaker in the for-profit establishments, where I personally don't see a pressing need to allow people to consume the product. But in these long-standing nonprofit societies that provide a, a sense of well-being and a community for people with very serious illnesses, uh, I think over time we will want to look to relax the regulations uh, to permit uh, uh, the consumption of the product. So, but that's something in my view, for another day, unless councillors have something ready to address that one. But I'm happy to support this and move forward. Thank you. So just for clarity for council and the public, we're now commenting on third reading of the cannabis-related business regulation bylaw as amended. So I'll allow comment on that in general. And then I want to draw council's attention to the fact that in the staff report that we've received for this evening, Mr. Coates has another proposed amendment that addresses that loophole that hadn't been closed that I think that we need to entertain as a council. But I don't want to get into closing loopholes before people have commented in general on the bylaw. So does anyone else wish to comment in general? Yes, Councillor Loveday and Councillor Alto, and then I will comment briefly. So on, on you know, the whole sort of the whole package here, I, I think this is a re reasonable approach that's uh, to regulation that's based on lessons learned from other jurisdictions, on a lot of meaningful public engagement with residents and community groups as well as health advocates, uh, marijuana or cannabis business uh, operators, as well as m many people who use cannabis for uh, medical purposes and people who use it for uh, recreational purposes. And I think that this is, this is the right way forward. I, I agree that some of it may need to be tinkered as, it, as it's implemented. I just hope that uh, as we get closer to federal legalization that uh, the amount of communication from the federal government increases and we start getting more direction. I, uh, I, uh, I still think it's ridiculous that we haven't received any, re any direction from the federal government as to uh, what that process will look like. Yes, I've... I've you know, I've seen things in the media and, and been able to Google some things, but nothing has come to uh, to the city and in terms of directing us in how how we can operate most efficiently and effectively in the interim in this during this time while well where there is a very flourishing gray market for for cannabis and uh, I. I on the, on the issue of uh, consumption, I, I do think that there needs to be places for people to be able to uh, consume their medical cannabis in, with dignity and in a safe place. And as we move forward with trying to establish safe consumption services for, for other uh, drugs in, in the city of Victoria, I, I think it would be uh, odd for us to completely shut the door on consuming uh, marijuana in a safe way. And uh, I, I particularly think of some of our most vulnerable residents who are quite sick and need, need cannabis for their medicine, and they can't, maybe they're renters, and they can't uh, in, inhale or, or smoke in their apartments uh, for fear of eviction. And uh, having a place for them to go would make sense. I think it also makes sense to move forward with the bylaws in terms of 
not having consumption on, at a business site. So uh, hearing from Mr. Zworski that there could be uh, ways around that, they may not be currently open, but that perhaps there's a, a non-profit model that is specifically aimed at uh, you know, medical users, that that might be something that uh, the city can accept and perhaps work towards. So I, I do think this is the, uh, a good step forward, and I'm glad that we've finally gotten here. It has felt like a very long process, and uh, I do hope it's all not for not for naught once we figure out uh, what's coming down the pipe from the from the feds. Thank you very much, Councillor Alto. Um, gosh, where to start? In general, I can understand the rationale for all of the components of this and uh, will likely support it moving forward, but I will say that I am profoundly troubled by the, the complexities of the prohibition around on-site use. I don't think that we've managed to find the right balance on that particular item. Uh, I think that it, it is illogical, as my colleague noted, that we are spending an enormous amount of efforts uh, partnering with a variety of different uh, public interests in trying to bring supervised consumption to Victoria. And that it seems entirely anomalous for us to be prohibiting the use uh, of cannabis while we're pursuing uh, that other venture. I also think that uh, dealing with the issue of on-site use is an important way for us to consider concerns that have been repeatedly raised by folks tonight and throughout all of the information that's been shared with us over these months about concerns around public use. And I think that managing on-site consumption will help us manage public use and will also help us manage unwilling exposure, as many folks tonight have spoken of their experiences of being exposed uh, unwillingly. I think uh, dealing with some type of on-site on use regulations would help in managing that as well. I also think that um, there's a gap here in this insofar as we seem to have been focusing primarily on how to manage the business venture side of this issue and haven't really been able to, with the tools at our disposal, venture into the notion of uh, use in this in the context of uh, health requirements. I don't know that that's within our authority, and that may be why we're conflicted in this point and why we haven't been able to address that sufficiently. And so that may be a gap that's beyond us uh, as a municipality. Having said all of that, um, given the work that's gone into this and the enormous contributions that have been made uh, from the public throughout all of these uh, ventures in the last you know, six, seven, eight months and longer, and the work that our staff has managed to uh, undertake and uh, the extent of, of what they've managed to present to us this evening. Uh, I will be supporting this and I will do so with this one reservation and that is I do strongly believe that we need to find a way for uh, not-for-profit entities to come together and provide the option uh, for on-site use for many of the reasons that have been relayed to us this evening. And I will heavily rely on the suggestion, I won't I won't categorize it as advice, but suggestions presented by our legal counsel that there is room here for um, a way to accommodate that not-for-profit compassion club model. I think those are the people who have been the pioneers in this conversation and have provided essential services for decades. And it is not my intention at all. It's never been my intention. I don't think it's the intention of most of my colleagues to try and create barriers for that type of consumption provided by those people. Uh, as a service. And so I'm hopeful that we'll be able to accommodate that particular aspect of it. And uh, I guess I will, with that strong reservation and those concerns expressed, uh, I will support this this evening. Thank you. Councillor Lucas? Thank you. And um, this is a, it's a very difficult um, situation that we are in. Uh, we really needed our, our higher levels of government to step in and uh, help us with this, but unfortunately that didn't happen. Um, I hope we've gone far enough in our regulations between now and when the federal government will come down, but I know that we haven't because when we have people 
that have come before us who feel that they are being driven from their home and their business, that tells me that we, we haven't met all of the requirements. And that's always difficult when we have to move forward. Um, I'm sad about that, uh, but hopefully that we can address some of these issues as we continue to move forward. Um, there's always the pros and cons on both sides of it. Uh, we're trying to address that the best that we can uh, without the support of the, of the federal government. Um, and I'm very sorry to the people who are here tonight that, that have felt um, uh, displaced and um, unhappy. Um, but uh, I think that, that we have, have done the best that we can at this point. We will continue to, to find um, the best answers that we can for this situation um, and um, look forward to when the federal government will put in um, those stronger regulations. Uh, I know that, you know, I take a look at the letter from the Victoria Downtown Residents Association that talk about their concern around are a lot of these places going to be grandfathered? when the true regulations come in, how are we going to deal with that if it differs uh, a great deal from what we're doing here tonight? So that's another concern that uh, we're going to have to work through. Uh, we don't know those answers yet, but we can't wait. Um, we have to deal with this now. So I appreciate all the people that came out tonight to speak to us. We got to hear your opinions, and uh, it's very valued. So thank you for coming. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to add a few comments. I won't make too many because it's late and we've still got a lot to do. Um, I'm troubled by the suggestion that these places should be open later than proposed because um, it's kind of like liquor stores. Liquor stores don't close at 7 or 8. Um, so is this medicine or is it recreation? What we're talking about are medical dispensaries. The, the federal government may legislate recreational marijuana and when the federal government does that we will leap to comply with what they're suggesting but that is not what we're talking about right now so the notion that you might not be able to get medicine if the dispensary is closed they're open seven days a week presumably and if you're organized you can get medicine uh, in the long uh, time that they're open so this this kind of this comparison between medical dispensaries and liquor stores makes me uncomfortable I have to say um, and and to that end the, the notion of making a business of providing somebody a medical service to consume also troubles me because we have a public health care system in Canada and it should not be private businesses that are providing much needed medical consumption. So I'm, I'm troubled by some of the things that I've heard. Recreational consumption, again, that is not what we're talking about tonight. Um, that again will leave to the federal government. But to be very clear, these bylaws are meant to uh, make sure that people have access to their medicine. They are not meant to enable recreational consumption. They are simply not. And so I want to be really clear with everyone who came, particularly the people who thanked us for being progressive, and we are for allowing edibles. We are. I mean, we've gone out on a huge limb on that one. I expect, and I think that council expects, that once these bylaws pass, particularly it's the zoning bylaw tonight and the business regulation bylaw will come into effect on the 22nd and then will be enforced as of the 23rd. We expect that there will not be businesses, and again the question of clubs that are servicing people who have a medical need for consuming that are not making money off of people's medical need, quite frankly. That's another story. We expect that there will not be consumption of cannabis at any of the places that are going to be open as a result of this new licensing regime. That is our expectation, to be perfectly clear, just so we're all clear. Those are the rules. You're thanking us for progressive rules. We expect everybody in this room and everybody beyond this room to follow those rules. All right, that's all I have to say. Hopefully I was clear. Any further speakers? 
Okay, all those in, oh, sorry, Mr. Coates, we have a few more uh, potentially housekeeping amendments to make sure we're clear. Mr. Coates. <clears throat> Mayor Helps, members of council, so in the staff report in your agenda package tonight, there are um, two proposed amendments for council to consider. Uh, the first one, and Ms. Havelk has got them displayed on the screen now. The first one is to um, make changes to the proposed uh, marijuana-related business bylaw to uh, to attend to the license fee, and, and the essence of this change would mean that the, um, the businesses that would uh, distribute marijuana have marijuana on the premises, uh, aside from the storefront retailers, would also be subject to the $5,000 business license fee. Uh, staff understood that, um, and certainly our intent bringing this forward to council was to have any business operation that, that distributed marijuana either by retail or other means uh, would be captured with the, the, the majority of the regulations proposed in the, in the bylaw. Uh, and as well as the, the higher license fee of five thousand dollars, so that's that's one of the changes. Okay, um, let's just treat them one at a time, just for for clarity. So you're proposing that we move um, three A and B. That's as correct, and, that, and that's staff's recommendation. Okay, so council, st yeah. staff are recommending that we move item three A and B as an amendment to the bylaw currently on the table. So it's basically a lower fee for places where medical marijuana is not, medical cannabis is not sold. Is that correct? Correct. So the, the current, the way the bylaw is currently structured is that um, there's, there's a two-tiered license fee, 5000 for those that retail mar medical marijuana from a storefront and $500 for a license, annual license fee for all their marijuana-related businesses. And so the, the gap that this proposed amendment would um, close would be that the $5,000 license fee would apply to those who distribute marijuana by other means than storefront retail. So the $500 license fee has always been contained in the bylaw for related businesses, but those that don't have marijuana on premises. Got it. Okay, thank you. Are we clear? Um, could I, I will move uh, this proposed amendment. Is there a seconder? Sure. Question? So, w <clears throat> could, could you just get some examples of what B would cover? Through my help, so B would cover uh, a business that uh, would would um, distribute products related to marijuana. So, uh, uh, I think the common terminology might be a, a bong shop, something like that. The the businesses that don't have marijuana on the premises, but they supply. Uh, products that uh, might accompany the use of marijuana. And for uh, these types of shops, which have been open for decades, as opposed to ones that are actually selling uh, cannabis, what's the what? Aren't they just retail? Like, so what? What is the what licenses do they currently have? Through my help, so a, a related business that doesn't supply marijuana from the premises would have a, a standard city retail business license. Good. Is there, so we don't have anything on the table. We can ask questions, but we can't debate this amendment until it has a seconder. And if it doesn't, then we just leave things as is. Yes. Do you have a question? Yeah. What if they're selling cigarette papers? And our staff thinks they're for the, they are a marijuana-related cigarette paper, and they say they're a tobacco-related cigarette paper. Who makes that decision, and how do, how do we decide? Um, through my help, that, that's a very uh, tricky question to answer. And so um, I think that, generally speaking, there would, there would be a, a number of related products that might... Um, lead to the formation of the opinion and, and applicability of, of this license fee. Um, so I think that, generally speaking, these kinds of related businesses have are, are multi-product businesses. And two, uh, just for clarity's sake, because I do make sure that I'm 
providing council with the clarity that's needed for decision making here is that um, this $500 license fee is already contained in the bylaw. Um, and so it is currently a two tiered fee. And so th this amendment is to bring into the $5,000 fee structure those businesses that would distribute marijuana other than by retail storefront. Thank you, that's helpful for clarity. So what we're doing is essentially B already exists. The proposal is to amend A, to add A so that the businesses that have marijuana related but not retailing also pay $5,000. So if that is something that we support, then we should second an amendment. Question yeah. on that. So that would be, for example, a, a bakery? Yes, something like that. Okay. So I'm going to try and move it again if there's a seconder now that questions are answered. I'm proposing that we add section 3A uh, and B as an amendment. Okay, no seconder. All right, no seconder, no, no, no discussion. Go to the next one, please, Mr. Coates. Just point of yes. clarity. I, I, I guess I still have questions. I just don't know exactly what they are. And I, so I, I guess I'll, be, I'll second it for discussion and then we can, I can continue to ask those as we hash them out. I, is that Sure, or floor? what we can do, what we can do is we amend bylaws uh, from time to time. So we're trying to make this clean out of the gates, but if something is not clear or council needs more information, there's nothing stopping us from making these amendments further down the road. Yes, uh, so it's been moved by, the amendment's been moved by me and seconded by Councillor Loveday for discussion. Yes. Uh, and just to clarify, so if I correctly understood the explanation uh, from Mr. Coates, uh, if this is not approved this evening, this particular amendment, then the current status is uh, that the fee is $500 for this category, right? And what we're actually considering is increasing it for this particular category to $5,000. Through helps, that's correct, and the category being the, those businesses that distribute marijuana other than through storefront retail. Right. Thank you. Yes, Councillor Loveday. So follow up on the, uh, I'm just searching through it, through uh, for actually part B. Uh, are you able to point where in the bylaws that the, like the 500 for marijuana related businesses are that are not selling, uh, that are not selling cannabis? So. I know that we're actually amending Part A, but this has alerted me to Part B in a way that I hadn't been before. So I'm, I, so I'm just uh, curious about that part in terms of, uh, I think it's very difficult to apply, and I'm, I also don't know if it's a good idea. Mr. Coates, which section of the bylaw? Uh, Mayor Helps from the Council, it's section 4.3 of the bylaw, and that's the section that says the license fee for the purposes of section 2B is $5,000 for a storefront marijuana retailer and $500 for all other businesses where marijuana is kept on the premises. Okay, so if we don't make this change, it stays as status quo. Bakeries pay 500 bucks. Everybody pays 500 bucks except retail. Okay, very good. So with that understanding, um, Shall I call the question on the amendment? Okay, all of those in favor of the amendment? Okay, one in favor, all of those opposed? One opposed, okay, folks, I know it's getting late. Uh, we, we still have a whole other public hearing to go after this, so we gotta, you know, get some coffee delivered or something. So I'm gonna try that again. Uh, all of those in favor of increasing the fee to $5,000 for any place that keeps marijuana on the premises, whether they're selling it or not. All of those in favor, please raise your hands. Okay. One, two, three, four. All of those opposed? Two. Okay. So that passes. That amendment has been made. Very good. Um, yes. Do you have another one, Councillor Isaac? Uh, the references to marijuana and that. Sorry, cannabis. Be, so cannabis. That, that. It's okay. It doesn't need to. We've made an omnibus motion to replace marijuana okay. with cannabis. Sure. Thank you. Thanks. Mr. Coates, what else? Mayor Helps, members of council, so the next one um, is not included in the staff report, but um, was pointed out that in, in section 10 of the proposed bylaw, 
there is uh, a few words missing from the uh, the completion of that sentence. And if so that's uh, showing us as item number two. It's just adding the words uh, after invalidity shall not affect the validity of the remainder of the bylaw. So th that latter Thank part you. of Moved that sentence. Thank you. Moved by Councillor Alto. Is there a seconder? Seconded by Councillor Lucas. Housekeeping. All of those in favor? Any opposed? Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Helps. Uh, so lastly, then, is a consequential amendment that was noted in the staff report, and that is to um, to add into the city's um, main business licensing bylaw an amendment that would uh, ban the consumption of marijuana on any business premise in the city. Thank you. Is there a mover? Uh, I will move this. Is there a seconder? Seconded by Councillor Young. Okay. So again, for clarity, any business? Some talk about nonprofits. Okay. Uh, discussion? Yes, Councillor Isaac? I think I'd like some specific language that would um, exempt nonprofit societies. Do nonprofit societies require a business license to operate in the city, Mr. Coates? No, they don't. Okay. So there, this is a business license bylaw. Nonprofits don't require a business license. So they are exempted by the nature of this being a business so license. Just to bylaw. follow up on that. So, for example, the Compassion Club on Johnson Street. Would they have to apply for a license in accordance with this bylaw, or could they continue to operate without doing that? Through my help, so the uh, the real determining factor would be the the business model for the particular operation. So they have to look into the into the validity of the not for profit arrangements. And so, it, not for profits in the city currently under the business regulation bylaw in general. Uh, don't pay business licenses, so any business fitting under that model would, would be in the same category. Thank you. All of those in favor? Any opposed? One opposed. Okay, Councillor Alto is opposed. Okay, Mr. Coates, is that the sum total of the staff's proposed changes? Yes, it is. Okay, thank you. We're almost through, thir through third reading of the very first uh, bylaw on this topic. Uh, is there any further discussion on the proposed changes to the business regulation bylaw? Okay, all of those in favor of third reading? Any opposed? Okay, Mr. Coates, can we adopt that one? No, we can't, not till the 22nd. Okay, so I will make a motion then to lift the zoning regulation bylaw amendment bylaw from the table. Is there a seconder? This is for the motion that Councillor uh, Alt, um, Isaac postponed earlier. Thanks. All right, all those in favor of lifting it from the table? Any opposed? Okay, thank you. So if I'm still with us, third reading of the zoning regulation bylaw, amendment bylaw is now on the table uh, for discussion, comment, or potential amendment. Any discussion? Okay, and for clarity, this is the one that out zones, prohibits uh, cannabis dispensaries anywhere in the city and then requires uh, cannabis dispensaries to apply for a rezoning process, or rezoning. Uh, Councillor Young on this um, bylaw. Um, yeah, I'm not supportive of this. Uh, partly, not, not so much the wording of the bylaw, actually, but uh, because of the um, accompanying policies uh, that foresee that um, a limitation of um, 200 meters between um, between stores. And yeah, my, my concern is um, simply practical. Um, somebody pointed out that by the time we start getting through this process, the federal government will be coming down with um, new laws, we, we assume. And I think the nature of the business is going to change so fundamentally uh, that all of the work we will do in attempting to choose between outlets that are within 200 meters of each other, and let's face it, that is going to be the uh, the the real point of the of uh, those zoning hearings. It's going to be uh, store versus store, and and um, we're going to have to be making those judgments. Um, should be making them on land use considerations, but I suspect that a lot of other ancillary considerations will 
will come in. Um, I, I'm convinced that um, the nature of the business will change, partly because of the, um, the what the, the, the mayor referred to, um, the lack of distinction between um, health and recreational uses of uh, cannabis. Um, that's going to be a crucial issue in the federal regulations. Um, we have a situation where um, a product that's traditionally been uh, raised through very small-scale agriculture, um, uh, people's basements, uh, some of it in these fortified bunkers, uh, little bits of land in the, in the woods, is now going to be um, produced presumably on, on uh, three-section farms in Saskatchewan. Um, the price, I suspect, will, um, will, will fall enormously. And um, the, uh, one of the things that's going to happen is there's going to be a lot of taxes imposed on recreational use and a lot of limitations imposed on medical use. And um, I, I, just, I just think that uh, a lot will change. And, and uh, I think um, for us, we, we are implementing these regulations because there's a, a legislative vacuum and something has to be done. Uh, but uh, I think things will, will change a lot eventually when, uh, when this... Uh, when the legislation at the national level changes. Thank you. Are there any further speakers? Okay. Um, I'll just be brief. Uh, I agree with everything Councillor Young said, um, and also as one of our speakers said this evening, even if the legislation is ready by the spring, and even if it's implemented, we're not going to see the effects of it on the ground here in Victoria for some time. Uh, and I think we do need to reach out to the task force and make a presentation uh, with regard to uh, what we are proposing to do and uh, hope that there's some uh, lineup uh, with what the federal government proposes to do. But I do not think that we can postpone uh, this decision uh, any further than tonight. And I hope that we will make that decision tonight. So are there any further speakers? Yes, Councillor Alto. Uh, yes, just to, to uh, reiterate, uh, I share Councillor Young's... Sorry, uh, sorry to interrupt, Councillor Alto. This is my fault. Uh, it is 11 o'clock. We need oh, a motion yes. to extend. Um, move Thanks. Moved yes. by Councillor Alto, seconded by Councillor Loveday. All those in favour? Any opposed? Okay, thank you. Continue. I'm usually very reluctant to make that motion, but there you go. Um, I, I share much of uh, the comments made by Councillor Young. Uh, when we started this process months ago, I was opposed to us moving forward. Uh, I do think that uh, it is going to be... Um, inevitable, as several speakers remarked this evening, that we'll be revising substantially, if not throwing this out entirely, uh, once the federal government gives us our marching orders. Uh, that being said, uh, it would be difficult to, uh, I think, ignore the groundswell of commentary that's come forward from folks who are supportive of the use of cannabis in various ways and folks who are not, who have equally asked for perhaps different reasons for there to be at least uh, interim regulations brought forward by the municipality. So uh, in light of uh, my interpretation of those uh, very eclectic requests, uh, I will support this moving forward. But continuing to um, register my dismay at the lack of direction from the federal government and the hope that they will bring some order to this soon. Thank you. I'm going to call the question. All those in favor? Any opposed? Okay, thank you. And that bylaw we can adopt tonight, so I'll look for a motion to move that bylaw for adoption. Thank you. Moved by Councillor Isaac. Is there a seconder? Uh, sorry, and just note that Councillor Young was opposed before. I didn't look that way. I apologize, Councillor Young. Uh, moved by Councillor Isaac. Sorry, I missed. Is there a seconder? Seconded by Councillor Loveday. All those in favour? Those opposed? Okay, thank you very much. That matter is dispensed with. Uh, we are at a, in a bit of a pickle right now, or I am, uh, trying to decide if we are going to be able to give clear and fair consideration to the uh, development permit with variances for 1421 Fairfield Road, or whether we should postpone that hearing for two weeks. Uh, are you the applicant? 
Okay. Is the applicant here? Yes. Does the applicant uh, object to postponing consideration of this matter for two weeks? I'm not proposing that. I'm asking you for your... Have it happen tonight? Okay, very good. Then uh, we will move on to the hearing for 1421 Fairfield. Actually, Council, let's have a five-minute break to clear our heads a little bit. Uh, and just note for members of the public, uh, we do have still much work to do even after the hearing for 1421 Fairfield.